Welcome back to the Policy Viz podcast. I'm your host, John Schwabish. On this week's episode of the program, I am joined by Cole Naflick of Storytelling with Data. Cole has a new book out that is launching today, Tuesday, September 27th, out into the world. It is called Storytelling with You. It is about doing a better job of presenting data, presenting information. She takes you through the entire process of generating ideas and coming up uh, with the argument, storyboarding, all of the things that you're gonna need to know to create more effective presentations, to have better meetings, to have better arguments. And so Cole and I go way back, we have a great conversation, we talk about the different parts of the book, we talk about the importance of working low tech, Cole's a big proponent of post-it notes. Uh, So we talk about that. We talk about uh, the mixed meeting. What do you do about that mixed audience? And then we dive into a few other things, including whether or not it's good to be different when it comes to giving your presentations. So I hope you'll enjoy this week's episode of the podcast, and I hope you'll check out Cole's new book, Storytelling With You, and you'll check out her various websites, including, of course, Storytelling With Data. So On this week's episode of the show, Cole Naflick joins me, and here is our conversation. Hey, Cole. Good morning. 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 Both of our times. I think we're doing. Yeah, it is morning here, but it may not be for those listening in. Late at night listeners (laughs) enjoying their podcast listening as they get ready for bed or eat their ice cream or whatever. Um, Great to see you again. It's been been a while. Yeah, it's been too long. Yeah, it's been like maybe like two and a half years or so, something like that, right? Hmm, I wonder what happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in the meantime, you have a new book out. Uh, I do. I'm time of posting yeah. this podcast episode today. On publication day? Publication day. day. It, so for those listening on September 27th, 2022, what a day. <laughs> the book John's talking about, I'll hold it up because you're on video. I don't know if anyone else is. Storytelling with you, plan, create, and deliver a stellar presentation. And I think timing is really good for this one, which wasn't always the case. Because this one really, if, if we think back to the other books, right? Storytelling with data that really focus on how do you make a graph that makes sense and then weave that into a story. I think one of the things that's become increasingly apparent to me over time Mm -hmm. as we've been focused so much on graphs is just the role that the individual plays in that communication process. And so this book really dives into that. How do you communicate effectively, irrespective of whether it's graphs or anything, uh, from the low-tech planning to creating materials that are going to support you to turning attention on yourself and developing the way you speak in front of others to help make them want to listen. And so I say timing is good because I, I started the, writing this book way back in 2018 and then got excited about it for a bit. I wrote the introduction and sketched out the table <laughs> of contents then and then shelved yeah. it and did Let's Practice instead. Right. And I was just ready to dust it off. And then global pandemic hits. And I was like, Maybe something else. people may never actually talk to each other in person again, which makes this fully irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, but then when the pendulum started shifting back, like, well, no, people are going to talk to yeah. each other. And to a large extent, we've all forgotten how. Yeah. So this will be a good I mean, I've forgotten how to wear a belt, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I do not miss wearing belts or, you know, ties, certainly. <laughs> um, so so help us understand even a little bit more. So the, the progression of your books has been storytelling with data. And that was what, 20... 2015? Yeah, 2015. And yeah. then the workbook came out. 2019, 2018? Yeah, Let's Practice was 2019. 2019. Yep, good memory. So did you see, aside from everything you just mentioned, did you see, a, a, were you getting calls for a need for another another book that focused more on the presentation side of things? Like, where did you see that, like, that, it's not quite, it's a little bit of a pivot, but we're not, like, a big pivot. It is. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's grounded in the same things that we teach and think about when it comes to how you look at data, and, and particularly when you're communicating it with others. But really, you can apply, I I was realizing, I think, teaching more people and in different spaces. And as you talk about a subject, and as you learn about and practice a subject, I think the boundaries of that naturally expand. And so one of the ways over time that that was expanding for me and has been expanding for the team is 
you, know, you might be able to make a great graph. And we can see all these examples of people making great graphs that still don't end up serving the intended purpose mm -hmm. and, and not through any fault of the visual design or, but because of how that's communicated. Right. And so when we think about basic tenets of communication, which is always what we focused on with the data piece, but applies to almost all of our daily interactions, right? It's your audience mm -hmm. is the foundation for so much. How do you think critically about who they mm -hmm. are and communicate first and foremost for them, right. not you, and through that yeah. get your needs met? And really this pivoting to thinking about how we communicate generally and being thoughtful about the people on the receiving end of that. So you figure if we have something that's important enough to talk to someone else about, we should care enough to take the time to do that yeah. well. And just translating that into the real practical, when you can do that well, people are more inclined to listen. They are more inclined to engage and discuss and hopefully act. And I think that's really part of the driving force behind it was seeing great work that wasn't having the impact that it could mm -hmm. have if some of those pieces had been approached differently. Right. And we should clarify. And so for me, sorry, I was just to say, we should clarify ahead. for everybody that it's not, it's not just a book on presenting graphs and data and charts. It's, it's, it's the, Correct. it's the whole sort of more of the whole, all of the things that people would present, right? All of the texts and all the photographs yes. and the process by doing that. Yeah. And the, the idea is, you know, if you have a critical business meeting or an important presentation of some sort, the book basically lays out a process that you can follow to plan your materials, create those materials, and then prepare yourself to mm -hmm. deliver. And so, but it doesn't mean you have to have an important presentation on the horizon yeah. to find utility yeah. here. And sort of, I, I think of it as the more important the thing is, the more time you should spend doing mm -hmm. all all of this yeah. stuff. And then, you know, we should always be optimizing given time and other constraints. But I think for me, it's similar to how I approached the first book, mm -hmm. Storytelling with Data, where that was, I'd been teaching about graphs for a long time, had a lot of examples and just wanted to speed that process mm -hmm. up for others, right? Where others don't have to go through all of the trial and error because people before them right. have done that. Right. And, yeah. and here's what that looks like. And here's how you can approach it. And for me, the, this book is similar. You know, having gone in front of thousands of audiences over the past decade, the things that I've learned when it comes to presence in a room mm -hmm. and, you know, down to nuances like how where you stand makes a difference or how you use your body and your voice yeah. makes a huge impact. Yeah. And these are things because I think it's too many people find it, or I'll rephrase, a common myth is that people exist who are just excellent storytellers, excellent presenters. Right? We've all seen people like that before where you think to yourself, wow, that was amazing, right? I was moved by what mm -hmm. they said. I couldn't attention to anything else. I think those skills existing in the wild are rare. In most cases, you get that experience because that person yeah. practiced and prepared and did all of these things behind the scenes. And so one myth I wanted to spell is just this idea that, well, that person's a good speaker. I'm not. I'm not yeah. naturally a people. Person. I'm not a naturally good communicator. Right. Because I turn that around to think like, I, me, Cole, was not a naturally strong communicator, mm -hmm. right? I think back to my first few times in front of audiences and it was like a shaking mm -hmm. leaf and, mm -hmm. you know, just trying to get through it. But then over time, because I became so passionate about the topic, that becomes contagious. Yeah. And so then I ended up putting myself out there in ways that were different over time and started seeing very different results mm -hmm. as as a result of that. And so using each time that you're in front of people to learn something new about how that interaction goes and how you present yourself or how you present your materials and rolling that then into the next time. So for me, that, that whole trial and error process over time of being the astute observer of my audiences so that I can understand when when did something just work yeah. really well and how do I lean further into that? Or, ooh, you know, people just kind of stiffened <laughs> uh, 
frowns yeah. on their faces. Are they mad? Are they confused? Should I stop and ask questions about this to mm -hmm. understand? Or did I just do something that I have to make sure I don't do that again? And so the book tries to speed up that mm -hmm. process and really mm -hmm. just help readers think about things in a critical way so that they're optimizing all of the different puzzle pieces each time yeah. they present an important setting, you know, whether it's a weekly team meeting or, you know, they're getting up yeah. on the stage. You know, one of the things that I have found is that people see the return on investment pre in presentations differently than with data visualizations because, mm -hmm. and I think it's because you put out a graph that gets picked up by the New York Times or you get a lot of hits on your blog or, you know, you get a bunch of retweets on Twitter and it's that really good single image and it gets picked up. Presentations, it's often harder to see that tangible ROI, right? Because you get up in front of the audience, you give it but to is them. that ROI? The other things you described were not ROI Well. Either. Right. Something being popular. So yeah. it, it's, I'll just say it's different than the lens that I would put on that data visualization mm -hmm. or presentation, because for me, the successful one, what you need to see is the right sort of discussion mm -hmm. is happening or a good decision was made. It's not how popular was it or were people talking about the graph after the meeting? If they're talking about the graph after the meeting, you've got problems right. because that the graph's not the point yeah. of any of it. It's the, the message, the understanding, the acting differently or in a more informed way because of what you now know, whether that was achieved through a graph or other means. So for me, the efficacy of presentations is just the, how would you characterize it? Like the quality of conversations at an organization right. is getting And better. I guess sometimes that's hard to know. Which is impossible Right, it's to impossible measure, to measure. Right? And sometimes it's impossible <laughs> right. to know. I, I mean, it's one thing when you're, when you're presenting or having meetings inside your organization. It's another thing when, say, you mm -hmm. go to a conference and you give a talk and, you know, maybe there's some Q&A afterwards, but then maybe you go on to the next session, you go on to the next concurrent session. And, you know, it, it's hard to know whether your presentation changed minds or helped people do better. And, and, I, and that's just generally just like getting that feedback after, after your presentations. Well, and so one thing you can do is just be intentional about yeah. getting that feedback uh, because there's always some to mm -hmm. be had if you look hard enough. And so one of the first things you have to decide is if you want it, right, you're going to yeah. act on it because getting feedback in absence of wanting <laughs> yeah, to right. listen to it, if the only feedback you want is right, that exactly, was perfect, right. Right, don't ask right. for feedback. <laughs> okay. But the more you can do in any scenario to create that feedback loop if it doesn't exist naturally. And so at a conference, that could mean, you know, instead of dashing out to catch your flight, mm -hmm. you stick around and chat with people and see what those interactions are like, right? What is the body posture of the other people? What sort of words are they using? And the body posture piece you can see while mm -hmm. you're presenting as well. So you can get some of that feedback. Uh, but yeah, to the point, does it stick, right? Did I yeah. change minds? That's a little yeah. harder to get, but that we should yeah. see out so that we can understand those sorts of things. And I think one thing that I recommend, I talk about this in the book, is when, you, when you're working on improving how you present, which I think everyone can do, right? I use every time I'm in front of other people to try to refine mm -hmm. something and, and learn and improve, that you can be pretty observant about yourself and how you're doing. So if you go in to a presentation and maybe something that you want to work on is filler words. You have a common filler word that you want to get rid of. So one, you can be aware of that going in, remind yourself of it. And when you do that, it'll be top of mind in a way that allows you to either choose your words carefully or be um, like you will know then when you say it, right? Because you've, you've got it in your head. Uh, you can plant someone in that audience to <laughs> yeah, listen right. for it, right? And I use filler words just yeah, as yeah. an example because it's a really discreet thing that's easy to measure. So you can do things to understand how that went. And then I think the process of reflecting, and it's one of the places where 
keeping some sort of ongoing document or journal just to say, what am I working on this time? And then reflecting back, how did that go? Uh, because it's it's hard for individuals to see progress mm-hmm. in their presentation yeah. skills directly. And so by having this, you know, then it allows you to flip back and be like, oh, wow, back three months ago, I was working on these things. Like now that's not even on my mind because yeah. I've continued to. You know, it, it's funny the way you, you, you describe some of these things. We, we were talking before we started recording, you know, catching up on families and whatnot. And I was telling you my my son is working on his baseball skills and we were at the cages last night with him and some friends. And, you know, I was saying, you know, you guys, if you want to make the next level, you have to work at it. You know, every day you got to get out there and, and hit off the yes. tee for an hour. And, you know, the one kid that I'm working with last night, he's like, oh, I can feel that, you know, my hands are dropping. And I'm like, okay, so for the next, you know, 20 pitches in the cage, just focus on the hands, not dropping. Just focus on that one thing because you're going to do it 500 times. So just focus on that one thing now and then focus on the next thing next. And that's how you get better. Well, and then that right. becomes muscle memory. So now the next time you get to draw on that piece and right. focus on right. something new, right? So right. the game continues, your game. Yeah. Continues I mean, how many talks do you give where you just could like do it almost without thinking? Yeah, yep. there definitely are some. And there's utility in having that brain mm-hmm. power free. And f- because for me, that was when I started being able to be really observant in what's going on. Like, how can I use this room? How do yeah. I use this space? You know, understanding how me doing different things impacted an audience simply by observing their responses. H- have you found that after two plus years of doing what I'm guessing is countless presentations on Zoom? or whatever that that has <laughs> helped or hindered how you now, as we get back to the real world, how's that helped or hindered how you present live? You know, one thing that I think, and, and we've always been fans mm-hmm. of recording ourselves. It's one of the ways that we learn at Storytelling with Data. When we have new hires come in, recording yourself mm-hmm. and watching it back is a big part of that learning process, which is <laughs> always. painful always, but really <laughs> eye-opening in useful ways. But I think Zoom made that process mm-hmm. even easier for us. And so we certainly have been watching ourselves more than ever before. And even we'll have you know, two data storytellers teaching a mm-hmm. workshop together. So they're not only experiencing their own part of that presentation, but they're seeing their co-presenters. Uh, and so it makes it easy to be able to give feedback yeah. afterwards in, in ways that's useful. So I think there've been some, there's been some useful things for sure. And then just yeah. the reach obviously where we can be talking to people in a completely different part of the world, having not needed to travel yeah. and spend the time <laughs> and the right. cost to do that. Um, although I would happily travel to do more in person uh, at yeah. this moment yeah. in time. I think we've gone too far in the other direction, but that's another topic for another day. Yeah. The, the space you get is more constrained to as a speaker in virtual land, right? Figure you've been flattened. uh, You've been made, you've been reduced in both size Mm -hmm. and dimension. And so, you know, I think of myself as an introvert, you have to put out a lot more to get less back because your audience has been reduced to two dimensions and reduced in size as well. But it does help you focus, you know, back to your baseball example, like just just focus on where your hands are. When you're in flatland and you don't even know if people can see you, you might be a tiny thing in the corner of their window. Now I can really focus on how Mm -hmm. I use my voice. And you can be really intentional about doing things that will help get people's attention or maintain it. And you know, it's even an argument for maybe having camera off some time to be able to do that. And actually, when you record yourself, and I talk about this in the book, but I recommend you mm-hmm. watch it back a few times. So you watch back once just to <laughs> get over yourself. And, you know, the fact that you sound yeah, different and right. look different than you thought you did. Yeah. That, everybody has that reaction. So yeah. watch it once just to get through that. Watch it again. And when I say record yourself, it doesn't have right. to be a whole presentation. Like a slide or two or talking for a couple minutes is enough to pick up on things that you do well and things you might want to adjust. But so watch it once to get over yourself. Watch it a second time where you've turned down the volume and you're just watching yourself. Yeah. Right? How does that look? Are you like all over the place? When I watch myself, I notice yeah. that I, I just, I move still yeah. too much and it's good to move. Motion is attention grabbing, but I move my yeah. head around a little too much, I think when I'm sitting, but that's fine. And then you watch it a third time with the video minimized yeah. or out of your line of so, sight where you just yeah. listen to yourself. 
It's amazing what you can pick up and curb immediately when yeah. you put some attention. I find that the energy is much harder on Zoom, especially when folks don't have their cameras on. I mean, I, I mean, it's yeah, possible. I've had this, yeah, I've had this cameras. idea that Zoom should, you should be able to load up like a thing on top, that sits on top of Zoom, which is just a bunch of people like nodding and smiling at you, so that you know, like, smiling oh little, yeah, that's yeah, some, yeah exactly. Just every once in a while, or like yeah. a thumbs up. Um, the energy, the energy is, is, is harder, I think, on the Zoom. Well, and so then that's where you can, you can kind of trick yourself or you can do things to make that not be the case. And so actually, I know with our workshops, it ends up being when you can't see other people, our presenters mm -hmm. are presenting to each other, right? And so you at least get that visual cue because you're right. All it takes yeah. is having a person or two in your line of sight that you can tell are paying attention and nodding and smiling. And so in complete absence of that, what I'll do is just imagine yeah. that that's the case, right? That I am just <laughs> giving the best presentation ever and people are nodding right. and they're loving it, right? I don't have any visual cues to tell me otherwise, so I might as well. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier, um, you used the phrase low tech. And I wanted to ask you about that because you, early on in the book, you talk about using some low tech techniques. You talk about post-it notes and, and some other things. And I just wanted to, 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 to get your, get you to talk a little bit about that and why, and you, you've spent a lot of time at storytelling with data, focusing on the low tech post-it notes, sketching. Um, and I, I wanted yeah. to get you just to talk a little bit about why you think that low tech approach is so important for folks. Absolutely. So in the new book, there are three sections, plan, create, and deliver. So the entire plan section, it's the yellow section in the book, is focused on all of these sorts of low-tech activities that you mentioned. And there's a chapter on audience, one on getting really clear and concise on your message, on storyboarding, compiling the pieces that are going to support that, and then forming those into a story. And the value of low-tech is the fact that it's slow. And it forces us to pause and be reflective and think about things like, okay, if that's my audience, well, first, who are, who are they? Can I narrow that group further? What are their shared interest, interests? How can I communicate in a way that's going to be effective for that group? And then what are the pieces I can put together, right? You mentioned post-it notes, which are one of my favorite tools of all time because they're small, they lend themselves to be easily rearranged, they have a bit of stick, so you can kind of yeah. explore different ideas without committing to them, uh, different narrative flows or ways of organizing your materials. And so for me, the, the benefit of the low tech is it forces you to pause or you have to physically mm -hmm. put pen to paper and think about each mark as a result of that. And there's just, there's good thought that goes into how we approach mm -hmm. communicating when we do that. The counter to that is I don't spend any time planning. I go straight to mm -hmm. PowerPoint or Keynote, right? Insert yeah. your favorite slideware uh, there. And I just start making slides. And I'm not making slides for my audience. I'm making slides for me. I'm making slides for my data. I'm making yeah. slides for my project. Whereas when you start low tech, you automatically have to think about your audience and what you're creating and why you're creating it. And that, even if you don't you know, do every bit of it, any amount of time you spend there is going to mm -hmm. make the product better because you're able to iterate in fast ways and explore different ideas. Maybe you even talk through some of these ideas with someone else. And so then you get this plan of attack that you've mm -hmm. vetted in different ways to then bring it into your tools and start building the materials that will support you in light of that specific reason that you're communicating and who's on the other end yeah. of it and all Do you that take thing. the same approach for every talk that you give or do you... Um... Uh, I don't know, sort of make it a function of, I don't want to say the importance of the talk, but I guess that's kind of what I'm thinking of, you know? Yeah. I mean, one should always optimize given, right. you know, given how critical something is and the different constraints that are faced. If I'm doing something important, right. then yes, this, I do right. all of this every time. And I try to not do things that I think are not <laughs> yeah. important, which means I'm doing yeah. more of this more of the time right. than I'm not. 
uh, writing the book, for example. So mm -hmm. for me, that's an important thing, right? It's not getting up in front of people and talking, but you do need to think about very similar things when it comes mm -hmm. to well, why are you doing this in the first place? Who is your audience? What's your message? How are you going to put yeah. the pieces together? And so, yeah, I do exactly this process when I write. And it's one of those things that can feel awkward and slow the first couple of times. Yeah. Everything pretty much is like that. And it just takes going through it a couple of times to really experience the benefits of, you know, of planning in that way and then be able to mm -hmm. utilize that and, uh, you know, make a better experience for everybody, for you, for your colleagues, for anyone you're talking to or giving the material to at the end of it better because yeah. of that planning that went into it. And so I think this stuff applies to communication yeah. in general, almost irrespective of medium or level of importance. If we all did this, we would yeah, all right. have better conversations. Right. And, <laughs> and, and, and you mentioned colleagues. I mean, I, I often wonder about, um, you know, especially sort of younger, more junior folks talking to their bosses or their managers and not preparing for those for those meetings. Like, it seems like we, we've taken the word presentation and in some ways distorted it, that it means standing in front of some big audience on a stage with slides behind you, as opposed mm -hmm. to thinking about almost every meeting is a presentation in, in some, yes. you know, it's a spectrum more yes. than a binary. I wouldn't say almost yeah. that every meeting is a presentation, right? How formal it is yeah. or what it looks like will vary. But every time you open your mouth, you yeah. are you are communicating yeah. and presenting something, some idea, some concept, some some feeling to someone else. And the more thought we can put into that to make that not a fantastic experience for us, but a fantastic experience first and foremost for the others to whom we're communicating the better yeah. communication everyone's um, I have. want to ask you about the mixed audience. So you mentioned this up front in the book, and I think it's yeah. one of the questions I get a lot. And I think it's a, it's a hard, it's a hard answer, right? So how do you think about, you're going to go give a talk, maybe you don't know necessarily, you know, who's in the audience. And, and so yeah. how do you approach that sort of big mixed audience? Yeah, mixed audiences are hard, but that's kind of nice, right? Because if all of this stuff right. are really easy, it would look the same every time and that would be no fun. Uh, mixed audiences because, so I think of a mixed audience as being comprised of people who have sufficiently different mm -hmm. needs and interest, interests that are going to be hard mm -hmm. to hit simultaneously. And so one of the things you can start by doing when you're facing a mixed audience, you've already thought through, like, do I have to communicate to everyone at once? Sometimes we don't, and then there can be value breaking them apart. But assuming that the answer is yes, you have to communicate to everyone all at once, right? This could be a conference presentation, as you mentioned, or it might be you're presenting to a steering committee made up of colleagues from different parts of an organization. Or in the book, I go through a case study mm -hmm. that we revisit every chapter. And the scenario there is I'm a consultant. I'm presenting to my client group, mm -hmm. who is this mixed uh, group of people. And so one thing you can start by doing is thinking through where is their common ground? Where, you know, even though this group is diverse, what, what could unite them? Because that can become a point from which you can communicate. So I'll just go to the example that I use in the book, right? I mentioned it as this mixed group of my uh, client people from different parts of the client organization. And so, you know, the, the finance person is going to care about something right. different than marketing, than, uh, you know, than all the, all the rest. But one thing I know unites them is that the perception of the mm -hmm. brand remains high. And so, okay, if I, if I know that, then I can get into things like we can spend time on the financials because I can ground that in, right? Not everyone may care about what the balance sheet looks like. Are we making money? Are we running things in a sustainable way? Like all of this stuff then feeds into brand. And if I can explicitly then make those connections, now I've made something that mm -hmm. may have come across as irrelevant for part of mm -hmm. my group. I've made it relevant. And you can think of the different forms that that would take. So that'd be one way, right? Find common ground, use that as a way to communicate or uh, to how you frame things. Another can be look for where there are differences and how you can share those in mm -hmm. ways that might be productive. So for example, when I was at Google, we would do this massive employee survey every year. And when we were going through the process of getting people to understand results 
and you know, how, how to interpret those. There were some parts of the organization where for a given leader, we wouldn't just show their scores altogether. We'd show their scores plus mm. their peers so that they'd have yeah. a basis of comparison. And we'd be able to then have a conversation among those broader groups where everyone could see the overall, everyone could see their sure. group and now how they compared across these different dimensions to others. So even though the numbers were different, we saw how they all fed together and I could actually learn from some of those different differences. There are some groups, by the way, where we absolutely could not do that because the <laughs> competitive nature between peers yeah. was not healthy. And so right, yeah. it comes back to audience, right? Uh, but those are a couple of strategies for making it work when you need to communicate to a mixed audience. And there are more uh, that I share in the book because yeah. there's a whole section on that challenge. So, so okay, so someone goes and grabs your book, they go through it. Do you think they are going to then go to their local, whatever, their school's PTA meeting and they're just going to like cringe the whole time? Like what should, what should their, like what should their... Oh, yeah. you mean watching other presentations or... Well, I mean, yeah. isn't that always the case, right? You yeah. learn how to make a nice looking graph and then every yeah. other graph you ever yeah. see is hard on your eyes. Yeah. The, the, the hope is that, you know, sharing the right. same stuff broadly is that we all get better. And I think yeah. leading by example, right? So if you're in an organization, all of the meetings are, you don't want to be sitting in there, right? It's hard to sit through, yeah. be the one that's different. Uh, you know, put some of these strategies into place and yeah. focus on changing the way you communicate. And yeah, the if communication, if the examples you get in your day-to-day -day of communication are not great, look for other examples and try to refine yourself in ways that others will- Okay, I was going to let you go, but you. then you said something. So I want to ask you one more question. Yeah. So, okay. So but, but last question, last question. So, so, um, okay. So you just mentioned, uh, try to be different. And I have heard from lots of different people. I even had someone said to me once, this is early on in my career. Do I really want to be the person who stands out? Now this was referencing like an academic conference, you know, and there's, hmm. there are some hierarchies sure. in Reese. There's a hierarchies, obviously everywhere. There's maybe more so in academia, right? Where yeah. junior folks, there's a, there's sort of the double-edged sword there, right? Um, but but what would you say to someone who says, do I really want to be that someone who stands out? Because maybe my manager is going to think, you know, this person has, you know, they've gone too far. They've, you know, they've, you know, any sort of thing you could imagine that you'd be criticized against. All right. Well, if your manager says that, then there are other issues. But yeah. I <laughs> No, I think it, it's a good point, though, uh, and the phrase that you pick up on, right? Because as a sound bite of, you know, be different isn't necessarily and particularly yeah. for those yeah. young in career. So I'd say first mm -hmm. and foremost, be an observer right? because you have to know when it makes sense to do things the way they've always been done because they've always been done that way. And there's some historical reason for that, right? Always assume, particularly going into a new role, always assume that People around you are smart and have made the decisions that have been made historically for good reason. Th this would be something I remember at, at Google coming in, right? new hires that would start questioning things yeah. before building up the context of why it was that way. Because oftentimes there is specific organizational right. context that makes it all make sense. And so you can actually shoot yourself in the foot by going too hard there. So starting by playing the role of the observer, but then understanding what can you, what can you learn in the environment you're in? Where are people doing things mm -hmm. that you aspire to? How do you break that apart in ways that you can use to refine your own skills? Uh, but then also where are there are areas that you mm. shouldn't propagate further, right? And so if, if you're having a lot of ineffective meetings, like, yeah, I would want to yeah. be the one that's different there who has effective meetings, but this isn't be different for the sake of being different. This is be thoughtful about where you put your time and energy and do that in smart ways that will work, that will serve you well, and that will also yeah. hopefully serve Terrific. the organization. Cool. Well. Congrats on the new book. Very excited to see it out today. <laughs> Thank um, you. And yeah, and good luck with everything. Great yes. to see you again.
Thank you. And I'll just have people go to storytellingwithyou.com where you can see all the places to order it. You can download sample content. And if you read it and love it, I will appreciate your stellar review. Thanks, Cole. Great to see you. Thanks for having me, John. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the show. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you'll check out Cole's work. I hope you'll check out the new book. And if you'd like to support the podcast, please rate or review it on your favorite podcast provider or support it financially by going to PayPal, by Patreon, or signing up for our Winnow app where I communicate every week via text message, different data visualization tips, tricks, and strategies. So until next time, this has been the Policy Viz Podcast. Thanks so much for listening.